Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hello, everybody. We did it. Um, uh, wait, can you say that again? I just said, all right. Oh, good, yeah, sorry. The, the audio came out a little uh, tinny. Um, oh, so I was just thinking about you. Uh, honestly, I, just before we got on the show, um, I got an end-of-life email uh, from <laughs> Elephant Sequel. So they're basically deprecating the hosted Postgres as a service that I use. And, uh, and I'm why, why did you deprecate this? Like I, you know, why do you, why do you hate good, nice things so much? Uh, this is my question to you, Stuart. Ah. It's, it's, it's in the nature of things. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm really glad you're here. This is great. But uh, uh, what is, so I, I've known you, uh, uh, you know, through the, the, the Java community for uh, going on more than a decade now, and and uh, I finally pinned you down and got you to show uh, appear on the show. I really appreciate that. I know you're like, you know, literally changing the world with Java, uh, yeah. and so no, I mean really, it, uh, and obviously I, I'm very grateful for that. So thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, can you tell people what you do besides take away our toys? Like what what yeah. what what's your thing? You know. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, so let's see. So I think, uh, so I've been working on the JDK for over 10 years now at Oracle. Um, I'm, I, I'm sort of, so, so inside of Oracle, I'm the project lead of our core libraries team. And so that means I look after a lot of stuff internally that's going on, even though, even though it's an open JDK is an open source project. Uh, there's lots of internal coordination we need to do, so I spend up spend end up spending a lot of my time doing that. Um, I think what most people are interested in is is technology development or evolution or evolution of the JDK, and so um, and I think personally I'm interested in that. There are yeah. everybody everybody likes to talk about ooh let's hack out new code and add new features and. The fact is that there's a lot about maintaining, developing and maintaining a software product that people actually use. There's a lot more than just hacking out code and adding new features. And so, um, so part of that is, you know, in the industry, there's stuff about, you know, the software development life cycle and that kind of stuff. Isn't that what uh, Borland's doing these days? What's that? Isn't that what Borland's thing nowadays? Borland? Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, there, it, it's, it's, you know, it's one of those things when you get consultants involved in stuff and they wrap up everything in buzzwords and, and processes. Uh, oh, hey, hey, I feel seen. What's going on? Hey, hey. <laughs> it kind of takes a lot. Right. But I think that the fact is that there, there really is, there really is work to be done. Right. So we, you know, have to pay attention to fixing bugs, have to pay attention to quality, have to pay attention to testing, have to pay attention to uh, compatibility. And along the way, when you know pieces of the platform or features become obsolete, uh, you know, it's time to say, you know, maintaining this is not worth it anymore. And yeah. I think the responsible thing to do is not to just neglect it and say, oh, don't just stop using that old thing. And then just leaving it there and letting it accumulate cruft, because um, it in fact that doesn't work. Because when you add something new, you kind of have. To... Actually, this happened with lambdas. Like when we added lambdas, it exposed a bunch of things elsewhere in the system that right. we need to work on. Right. So the 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 classic example is serialization. We had to upgrade serialization, or in order to accommodate lambdas. Um, right. That happened with enum. In Java 5, when enums were added to the language, that was a special thing, and um, uh, serialization had to change to, to, to deal with enums. And in, in an odd sense, um, there were some assumptions about the way that RMI works, kind of separate from serialization. When lambdas came along, you know, people, people oh, discovered... Right. Well, uh, there are some things about RMI that don't quite work. It's it ends up uh, serializing using the wrong. Uh, there's some weird stuff about how it finds which type is the the remote interface. Right. 
And, and uh, when we added, I'm not sure whether it was default methods or serialization or lambdas that introduced some issues, but but there are some bugs in RMI that pretty much we've decided not to fix, but, but it's also exposed some weaknesses in that implementation. Um, right. So you so the answer is you can't just let stuff sit there. You right. either have to maintain it or the responsible thing to do is to decide to move it out of the platform. So that's that's the whole thing about deprecation. And um, uh, so that's part of what I do. Um, other stuff in the core libraries in Java, uh, I've done a lot of work on things like collection streams and lambdas. Um, most recently, I did sequenced collections, which uh, upgrades some collections APIs for the first time in quite a long time. Get first, get last, all that kind of stuff. Yep. I mean, it seems pretty simple, but you know, it takes it takes a lot of work to make something simple. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't say it was simple. I just said it was oh, really cool, and I, I was I noticed it. I saw it. I was uh, yeah. a fan of it. Um, that's really great. So, and actually, I mean, the collections are. That's another one of those things where if you change one thing for the worse, anywhere, you know, millions of people will notice it overnight. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You have gotta be super super careful. I'm I am such a big fan of the. I mean, the the ballet that you have to do on top of eggshells. I don't know, to mix a lot of metaphors, you know. Uh, right. Incredible. Um, okay, that's crazy cool. I, actually, you just brought up a bunch of things about which I, I'd love oh, to ask. Yeah. So, actually, before we dive in, can I can I post the link to Mastodon for this? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. That's the that's the other non bird site that uh, I tried to yeah. use and um, I could use. Oh, okay. Like. I'll talk to the audience here, friends. I I uh, I am embarrassed that uh, I couldn't find my Java shirt, uh, so I'm just I was gonna transform into my Java shirt for uh, uh, Java Luminary Stuart Marks here, and um, I couldn't find it. So I'm I'm just you know I, there there's got to be a is there like a store I can go buy one of these things? I I got one at a conference and I don't know where it is. Honestly, I, I looked high and low. I've I've scoured, scoured the earth. But uh, let me see. I'll bet Billy would know. He knows these things. Java T-shirts, Oracle. Hmm. Oh, wait. Okay, that's T Public. Need a new shirt? Of course you do. Okay, wait. There's a blog. Wait. All right. No, not it at all. So, do you know where I can get a Java T-shirt? That's an excellent question. You know. I mean, other than kind of hanging around the uh, Oracle booth at uh, at a which I do, yeah, I, I lost <laughs> it. Huh. It's got to be here somewhere. It's just... Okay, you know, you know what? Uh, do you know? Do you know the folks? You know the folks on our DevRel team. You just talked to Nikolai, didn't you? you yeah. You know yeah. the DevRel team. We should get. We we should we should. Uh, I would say the DevRel team is probably closer to um, the the folks you should talk to. To figure right. out how to get Java merch out there, we we need we need good we need a good Java merch story. Exactly. And I don't. Know, and the fact that the fact that I don't know where 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 else to direct you is is a problem. So, I I mean we're we're in the same boat. Years ago we had store that spring that I owe, which is yeah. uh, which is great because people I I often wear my little spring T-shirt and uh, and uh, yeah I was great. I could just point people to that, but now it's not there, and I I don't know it's. Yeah, it hasn't been any sense, you know. Or then the pandemic happened. It's just been a bad few years. Um, okay, okay, so I posted on Mastodon, so we can dive into our topics here. Okay, um, good. You yeah. mentioned the first thing. Uh, oh, how much longer does serialization get to exist? Like, like that thing is cursed, and I don't know how to. Like, are we? Is, there gonna, is that ever going to be deprecated? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the um, so, so the function of serialization is necessary. Yeah. Um, so, um, what am I? Uh, what am I getting? Okay. So, fundamentally, what you what you want is you have an object or you have some data, and you want yeah. to put it into bytes somehow. And to a certain extent, you don't. Well, you 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 actually might in, you might care what that encoding is. Um, and then you're going to send it to somebody who's going to, going to decode it and get back objects or data at the other end. And so there, 
that happens all the time and that's necessary. Yeah. Now there's Java serialization or Java, the sometimes people say JOS, the Java object serialization specification. So that's mm -hmm. the, that's the serialization that's built into Java. Um, are we ever going to get rid of that? You know, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I think I talks. like, yeah, it's, there are limitations there, right? Well, so the problem, okay. So I think we, the problem is the function is necessary and we believe that people use it a lot. And so when something is used a lot, then it's kind of hard to just get rid of it. Um, right. So, so serialization is particular, uh, particular problem. So for instance, I mean, so there are some talks out there and we can dig up the links to these afterwards. I, don't, I probably don't want to do it right now, but, um, I know that, uh, so Brian Getz, uh, wrote something a couple of years ago called, uh, towards better serialization. And he right. and I get to talk at DevOps a few years ago about, you know, why we hate serialization and, or why we hate Java serialization. Um, so we can find talks about that. So, um, we have a bunch of ideas for what to do with serialization. And um, you can start to see that in some of the stuff we did with records in Java 16 and serialization. I don't know if you uh, um, heard about any of that stuff. Um, so yeah. you can have, you can have, you can, okay, so. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> too much. <laughs> yeah, I don't want I, 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 you know, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this. But uh, so records participate in serialization in a slightly different way from ordinary classes, from the way that ordinary classes participate in serialization. So, that's so they point. fit. You don't have, sorry, what's that? Well, that's a good point. Actually, yeah, you can't have a serial serial UUID, right? Like, how do you define that field? Well, so um, actually, I think you can define it, but it's ignored. Um, uh, or is it? I, I think the the main thing is that um, regular Java objects are if are deserialized by magic, and and what happens is there's a special mechanism that serialization uses that says, uh, "Let's create an object without calling its constructor." So it's it's bare memory, and then what? What serialization does is it reads data off the wire and and uses a reflection to to stuff that data into into fields. Now you can you can modify that by providing a special magic read object method inside your class, and that lets you read the data off the wire and populate your own fields after you've been created through this non-constructor fashion. So that's kind of the way that classic Java serialization works. Right. Now with record, all of the guards that your constructors are supposed to enforce and all that stuff, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So so in your read object method, you're supposed to enforce the same invariance that your constructor does. And the, the the problem is that the read object method is optional, so that if you forget to do that, then somebody can stuff your object, stuff any data they want into your object. Um, so. Hmm. Um, so records sidestep that and remove some of the magic. And so basically the way that records work is that, um, so in fact, those, I, I don't know if, I, I think if you provide a read object method, um, it uh, it's simply ignored. Um, but instead, when you deserialize a record, the serialization mechanism reads the field data off the wire Right. And then calls the records canonical constructor. Oh, that's what you want. That's a, that's that's what we want. Yes, that's what I want. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Go on. So that's why that's one. That's a big step forward because Huge. that's that's, that's and right exactly. So 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 records coexist with the existing stuff, but there's much less magic. And the the one one of the one of the big themes of that talk that Brian and I gave several years ago entitled why we hate Ser java serialization is that there's a lot of things in java serialization that bypass the programming language so there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes and that's why i called it magic i mean obviously it's not magic you can go into the jdk and find the code where it does it it's just, just that 
Stuart, I just somebody asked, like, is this man a doctor and also a software engineer? To which I responded, he's a sorcerer <laughs> of code, a source ah. cooper. And uh, and uh, so yeah, you, magic would feel, you know, as a sorcerer, that's pretty much right up your alley. So I a get that. Sorcerer. Okay, yeah. <laughs> In the comments there. Anyway, carry on. So so anyway, yeah. So so it's not it's 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 not actual magic you, but but you know what i said in the in the outset was when you deserialize a regular java object it it creates the object without calling its constructor and if right. you look at the java programming language that doesn't exist yeah. right so so how is that possible well you can dig through the JDK code and find the place where it happens it says oh okay yeah there's a special case here it's deep within the internals where it, it allocates the memory for an object and creates it with the right class or type, but it doesn't initialize it. And then it relies on, on serialization to initialize it. And that's, that's the source of a lot of problems. And yeah. so with records, we say, you know, uh, since, since, since in the definition of a record, the, the, the state of a record is entirely contained in its fields and you you can initialize it entirely using the record canonical constructor. So deserializing right. record really should be nothing more than than gathering together the right data and then calling the constructor. Yeah, well, and well, one hopes that'll also be true for like regular Java objects at well, some point. Yeah, so so I think we can envision some kind of, and this is sort of going back to Brian's paper towards better serialization. Um, Ideally, you will want to have some some different kind of serialization API that that lets object let lets regular objects participate in the same way instead right. of this uh, instead of the the going behind the scenes like Java serialization does. Yeah. So you know, and so we don't know what quite what we still don't know quite what that's going to look like. Is it going to be an evolution of the existing serialization, and we kind of deprecate certain certain mechanisms, or is it going to be a whole new thing? Um, I think the other thing is that we we want um, if if you look at this, there, the the um, um, I was going to say one of the problem the big problem with uh, well one of the biggest problems uh, yeah. um, amongst the problems with Java serialization is so so there's the there's the mechanism for for. There's there's the interface to the object itself, right? Through the language, right? So how do you how does an object divulge the data that it wants serialized? Or if you're deserializing something, how does that that raw data get turned into an object? And so with records, we have a glimmer of that answer, which is that the way you turn something into an object is by Gathering together the data and calling its constructor. Yeah, and so uh, so you can certainly do that with a regular object, but doing the opposite is harder. And so you probably have heard Brian. Uh, I think he did talk about this in that why we hate serialization topic, but our, in, in that in that ser why we hate serialization talk. Um, no, still. But basically, it, I it, I hasten to say that he he was actually on the show. Oh. Somehow got on the show before you did. I don't know what that's about. I know you're very busy, but could have could have been on the show before. Uh, so we did actually talk about that. He talked about a not destructuring, but you yeah, know, the similar thing. Yeah, the right. exactly. That's it. Yeah. So 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 a regular object should be able to provide a deconstructor, and then some serialization framework should be able to call that deconstructor and get um, you know get all of the get all of the data that 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 represents what this object is. Right. Uh, and then, um, okay, so that's one half of it, which is where where uh, serialization and deserialization plugs into the object system. But the other half of it is how that ends up being encoded on the wire. And so um, the Java serialization mechanism has a purpose-built binary format for doing that. And there's a specification out there, and if people are interested, we can dig up the link for that as well. But um, it's uh, it has uh, certain limitations. Uh, it has it makes makes particular design decisions uh, and so forth. And and people don't want 
people often do not want that to be the target of what they serialize something to. They want something like JSON or XML or or you know some other format that they come up with. So sure. so so I think the successor to serialization will want to have have those cons so there are at least there there are at least two concerns here. One is the interface to the object system and the other is encoding and decoding. And right. so they're fused in the Java serialization mechanism. And we really want them we, we want them to be separated. So maybe the answer isn't that maybe the answer is if anything, it's more likely we get two well designed things rather than deprecating the old stinky thing. Uh, well, I mean, there are enough issues with the existing serialization mechanism that we may end up deprecating it eventually. Um, but we, then we have to might we have to think about a migration path and all of that kind of good stuff. Uh, well, actually, we have to think about migration anyway, right? So, so yeah. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I, just, I, just, I think we just haven't gotten that far with it yet. Okay, I'm just imagining the doctor doctor deprecator's list of to deprecate. I'm just wondering how big and juicy that bullet point is. What? Yeah. See what well, I think that's I think that's farther down the list because it's actually used a lot more. Uh, one one that is starting to come to the top of the list is RMI. Yes. Oh, oh good riddance. Yeah. Please. Um, so. Um, yeah. Uh, so so <laughs> so that's that's our. I, I guess you know. I mean, every. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering. Orbs, right? What's that? You already got rid of the object, uh, the orbs. Uh, oh, Cor yeah, yeah, yeah. Corbo stuff, so, uh, Corbo, Corbo stuff went years ago. Yeah, uh, so I, they could have just gone together if, as far as I'm concerned, you know? Yeah. Even, even, but, but, even, but they even were got more support for RMI and RPC within yeah. the frame itself, yeah? Right. Well, maybe uh, RMI is here. Right. So one of the, one of the <laughs> actually, probably. I, I my sense is that uh, that not many people use RMI anymore. Uh, unfortunately, one of the big customers of RMI, uh, customer to speak, is is the JDK itself, uh, JMX. Uh, yeah, is RMI. Yeah. Well, and plus every deployed EJB is also intrinsically using RMI as well. So it's just it, I, I, you know, if you had to deprecate EJBs, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, oh, I would. I would, I would yeah. muscle through. I'd okay. suffer through it, but I would. I'd be okay. Uh, okay. So well, we should talk about that because I don't know that much about what's going on on the, you know, the EE side of things. Um, yeah. uh, I thought that was only the remote EJB stuff, but yeah. that an intrinsic part of EJBs. Maybe that that part can be snipped off, but maybe the EJB stuff can go entirely. I mean, that's kind of up to up to you guys. I'm only being half glib, but also I don't. Yeah. I don't think that's big at all. Um. Well, that's good. Okay, so RMI. So the thing is, I'll tell you, uh, 10, 20 years ago, we had um, in Spring, we came out with Spring, we had these service exporters. It's a whole hierarchy of implementations that given a regular, do you remember the term POJO? We used to have to talk about regular yeah. job options like that was special. Right. Uh, given a POJO, we could export that interface remotely for access uh, uh, elsewhere. And so there was Hessian and Burlap from Resin. You remember the, our old friends at Resin? Um, oh, I don't, I don't, I never knew anything about oh, that. Stuff. Oh, Caucho, the is an application server vendor, uh, and so we had support for that. Those two different protocols, one was XML, one was binary. Uh, this is like a decade before JSON uh, took yeah. it over. And then we also supported uh, RMI, but we also supported my favorite, which is a Spring proprietary, like it was open source, but we created it. It's called the HTTP Invoker, and it had the it was the best and the worst of everything. It was RMI, no, it wasn't, it wasn't RMI, it was serialization, basically. Ah. Coded over HTTP, so you could go through firewalls that wouldn't otherwise let it go through. But the payloads themselves were just deserialized on the other side. And so it was actually quite clutch, because serialization, the reasons you just mentioned, uh, doesn't, like, if you try and do a circular reference in JSON, you'll just get a stack overflow, right? Whereas mm -hmm. with serialization, if it's valid Java, it usually is valid serialization. You know, it can be serialized in bytes. Yeah. Um, so you could actually expose really complex object graphs with this approach, send them over the wire, and they'd, they'd survive the trip uh, to the other side. And uh, so it was really convenient, but also, yeah, you know, like when you think about the serialization magic behind the scenes that was making that happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Well, and that's an interesting point too. That's a blessing and a curse, right? It's a blessing. <laughs> oh, it can it can do anything. Well, yeah. that's also a curse because it can do anything. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. Well, interesting. Are my uh, oof? Yeah. I haven't used that in years. Yeah. Um, but but it's also interesting when you talk about. Sorry, quick quick digression in this. So, sure. so one one is circular data structures and uh -huh. or data structures with cycles and um. Serialization claims to support them, and it mostly does. Right. But uh, it turns out that it can't. In, well, in the, in it mostly does, but in the general case, it can't. And sure. in particular, that's this is where serialization intersects with collections, right? So if you have if you have two hash sets, yeah, both mutable, so you can arrange for two hash sets to contain each other. But good luck. The, the, yeah, that doesn't make any sense because right. because the uh, you know and and people run into this. Uh, I mean, even so, serialization will kind of sort of handle it. It's, well, actually, it probably no, it it won't. Uh, yeah, because uh, well, okay. So the problem is that um, hash code is ill-defined for yeah. such a structure, right? So in practice, if you call hash code, it will just Call back and call hash code back and forth until it gets somewhere, right? So, in fact, a hash code of such a thing. But if you, that's the implementation, right? But what, you know, if you if you if you were to ask an oracle in the computer science sense what the hash code of that object graph is, there's no answer. It's undefined, right? So, so the idea, and then of course, what does it do? What happens when you try to serialize such an object? Well, it'll serialize them both, but it won't hook them up properly at the other end. Right. It, so, not great. So the idea of trying to support cyclic data structures, especially in something like serialization, uh, is is you know pretty pretty dubious. I agree. Um, I'm, I'm, when you make these network calls, uh, obviously, one of the things you're going to want to do is make sure that you have access to uh, the network sockets and you have access to all the sort of sensitive things that might let you violate the privacy of the applet in which you're running. But since nobody's running in applets anymore, why do we have security access managers now still? Like, like uh, you know, is that going to be deprecated? Well, the security manager and all of those related mechanisms have been deprecated already. Oh, good. Uh, okay. So, so oh, had, hadn't you heard that? Or was that just a set-off question? <laughs> I was just saying, yeah. <laughs> so, so there is a JEP out. It's been out there for a year or two now. Um, uh, is it JEP four twenty one? Wait, four twenty one, guys. What was four twenty? Just yeah. actually, I don't need to know. Oh, sorry, four twenty one. Sorry. Oh, it's pattern matching. Oh, that's pretty great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. I, uh, there, there was a little bit of talk about doing something special for JEP 420, but um, no, there have been rather too many 420 jokes uh, floating yeah. around uh, recently. So, so, so sorry. 421 is a, is deprecation of finalization. That we'll talk about that. We'll talk oh about yeah. That. So, so JEP 411 is uh, deprecation of the security manager. And so that that went in. Uh, I mean, the deprecation went in in JDK twenty one. And so, so a bunch of people, uh, including myself to a certain extent, are actively working to to remove the security manager. Um, okay. And so how is that going to break people's code, if any way? Like, I mean, well, I don't even know when the last time I used it. You know? Yeah. Um, well, that's the thing, right? So you can slice and dice up the the, the user base, right? So so I think you started off by talking about applets and running things in the same VM and stuff, right? And, and that's gone away, right? So that was one of the prime use cases for the security manager. And people have over the years, people have found other other right. So so if you look, sorry, if you look way back into the 1990s, it's like okay, well, there's you know, okay, I'm hand waving here. So we have a Venn diagram, right? Some some large fraction of it is is applets. Okay, so applets are gone, right? And so people right. have these small use cases, right? But it turns out that if you look at the all of the uses of Java, only a, a tiny number of them actually use the security manager. Right. Um, and um, a most use okay, so so what we in what we intend to do, and this is sort of hinted at in the JEP, 
Uh, but what we intend to do is remove the security implementation, security manager implementation, but leave most of the common APIs in place, but be no ops. So the uh, thing okay. is that there's there's uh, there's code out there, mostly in libraries or well some applications, right? But there's this highly stylized pattern that the JDK code uses, and that the that lots of library uses, which is when they say if system dot get security manager is not equal to null, right? Okay. So and then they save that, right? So they say they, you know if if you know var sm equals system dot get security manager right not equal to null so if that's not equal to null they know this is security manager active and then they say sm dot check permission blah 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 right okay so i think the easiest example to think about is get security manager right so so sure we're going to remove the security manager but we're not going to remove the at least not immediately but as the first step, we're actually going to remove the security manager implementation. And when you say system.getSecurityManager, it's going to return null. OK. Right? Okay. So most of that code, yeah, so most of that code is going to say, oh, there's no security manager running. And it's just going to skip any, any permission checks it might need. Seems reasonable. That's, yeah, uh, let's do that. I'm, I'm all for that. Yeah. Um, so that we, when was that, when do you think that'll land? Uh, I don't know. Um, we're still working through a bunch of logistics. The problem, the problem is, <laughs> the 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 amount of the security manager really has its tentacles all over the system, right? And I'm sorry if you look through the JDK code, there's this security manager stuff sprinkled around everywhere very thinly and so oh, it's, it's in spring too you know we we have to honor that in a lot of different cases as well so it's i'm just wondering like you know people use it and they need, we need to care about it in some places i don't i don't know don't ask me to enumerate all the ones i'm sure you're gonna could do it but it's there we, we, wow like, okay um yeah so when I, you know i don't know uh people are actively working on it though and um I'm not going to name a JDK release, but there should be something. Uh, you'll definitely see activity on it uh, later this year. Nice, cool. See, this yeah. is the kind of stuff I love. Is that there's this is all happening quick enough that it's like, okay, well, better get started on it. But it's also not quick enough that I'm like stressed about it. Unlike this Elephant SQL deprecation that yeah. I read the show that really hurts me. Um, well. So, so, but one of the things we, one of the reasons it's taken so long is we're we're thinking about this a lot, and we obviously need have a lot of work to do in the JDK. But we also are paying a lot of attention to not breaking people's code, right? So, okay. so most code doesn't use it at all. It shouldn't matter. But I think there is a lot of code out there that 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 you know says if there's a security manager active, then do this permission check. And I think there are a lot of you know if there's code that's written in that way that can continue to run, even binaries, not just source code. Wow, yeah. We, we are, you know, code that's written in that stylized fashion should be binary compatible, we hope. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you do more sophisticated stuff, like installing security policies and calling check permission directly on and use the access controller and stuff like that, you might have to do some, some work, but yeah. Uh, Okay, well that's cool. I mean that that kind of stuff is, uh, it's for the best. Obviously, I don't, I can't think of where it's even being used, so it's going to be good. Uh, this is yeah. this is one of those things where I think it'll impact some people, but we won't really know about it until it starts impacting people. And I'm sure it'll just do a quick find and replace, and it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Most things don't require it. Um, but you know, there's always there's always uh, new stuff, and there's always old stuff, and there's and right now the JDK is moving at a I wouldn't say breakneck pace, but it's moving fast enough that um, people can be caught unawares, which is a bit of a shame, actually. If you're unaware of something that happens only but twice a year, then maybe you should pay more attention to the Java ecosystem. But my question is sort of, how, what's the, is there like any guidance here for people who are, uh, you know, what's the, like I work on a framework, I work in the framework world uh, and Java, 
you know, that's critical to everything that the framework does. And of course, then the framework is critical to what people are doing. Uh, and uh, I think we on the Spring team, we just kind of release a new thing every six months now in lockstep with, uh, with Java, basically. So that way we always have a chance to adjust to calibrate. There's not like a huge gap where Java's out and it breaks Spring, but Spring hasn't cut, caught up yet, you know, uh, in some way. Not that it breaks Spring very often, but if it did, you know. Uh, what can you, what, do, what is the doctor's prescription for like keeping a <laughs> keeping uh windows of uh compatibility yeah well so that sounds like a lead into this whole concept of tip and tail um ah. and there's um i mean you have to yeah I, I mean you have to go back to the old the old style jdk releases and and so um people didn't people didn't worry about jdk releases too much uh which was yeah. a problem because there were two or three years or in in some cases like with jdk 7 there was a five-year gap between between releases um except that that when when jdk 6 came, this is actually before i worked on the jdk but when jd6 jdk 6 came out like uh, a year or two later there was jdk 6 update 10 which it didn't have any language or API changes, but there was a whole ton of changes and a whole bunch of stuff broke. So, so it was a real, it was kind of for an update release, it was actually a pretty major release. Okay. Um, Which is almost worse. Yeah. So, but there's this idea that, you know, that, that we finally, I think, gotten past, which is that, um, you know, JDK releases are big and you have to do a migration to every JDK release and, um, um, most people would kind of go through the pain of of migrating and then they'd forget about it because you didn't have to worry about the next jdk release for a couple of years yeah um, fractions of a decade yeah and so now there's a new one every six months and of course we have our lts's every two years now uh so <laughs> we, we were going to have lts's every three years but i think the three-year lts cycle lasted one, one cycle and then we said yeah. oh let's do it every two years instead you deprecated the deprecation cycle that's incredible <laughs> yeah. right so so there's all there's this huge proliferation of jk releases right so um and and the platform is evolving very quickly um in terms of uh, obviously the rate of change in 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 each release is sorry the amount of change in each release is smaller but overall i think you know it's <laughs> It's hard to say whether the 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 aggregate rate of change over time is um, is faster. It certainly feels faster. I mean, you right. can do something like count JEPs, and other people have done that sort of stuff. But a JEP is not. I mean, it's an imperfect measure of of the features in the system. It's kind of like counting lines of code. Um, it sort of might be correlated. If there are more JEPs, there's probably more stuff than few than than if there are fewer JEPs. But there are a lot of a lot of things that don't have depth. Not all depths are equal, right? Like, yeah, the uh, virtual threads was there's only one big jet or whatever, but yeah. it took seven releases, whatever, of previews yeah. to get out. You know, yeah, so, that was that was a, yeah, exactly. Not all jets are created equal. Some some jets are much much more complicated than others. Yeah. So so anyway, yeah. So what does that what does that mean, right? So it means that when you're when you're producing a library or a framework or or, or an application, you you need to do a lot more thinking about what releases you want to support. And um, um, <clears throat> I think we need to, I think it, it would be good to rethink that model because when, when releases are every three years, mm -hmm. you could kind of make some statement like, okay, well, I'm going to support uh, the current release and the old release. And that would last you for five years or something like that. Right. Um, and so um, now for long-term, well, I mean, long-term support, but for, for long-term evolution uh, and, and maintenance of things, people are gravitating around the LTS releases. And um, the LTS releases tend to have uh, uh, quite, a, quite a long lifetime. Um, I forget what the, the current support, um, so you can purchase support from Oracle for JDK seven, I think that's now the oldest. I think there was there was much rejoicing when we actually dropped. We we did drop support 
for JDK6 yes. some years ago. Uh, right. And we keep trying to drop support for JDK7, but you know, <laughs> some of our customers are still on it. Hangers uh, on. Um, by the by, just not for nothing, this is not a paid endorsement or anything, but I really think people should be buying something from the Java team, whatever whatever it is you're selling. I hope people will go out and get it because the Java team gives more than they get. And uh, and uh, yeah, if, if that's support, then go do that, you know? Um, anyway, carry on. Oh, by the way, we got a question. Um, what is this? I don't even understand this question. Do you understand this question? Oh, this one, I kind of remember this one. Very specific bug report here. Um, Secondary cache. I don't. I don't even know what. Uh, I mean, I could look it up, but I think it's it 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 sounds it sounds like it's something in the VM. It's a bit out of my uh, about a bit out of my purview. Um, yeah. Oh well. So oh, let's see. So where was this? Right. So we have. I mean. So if you look at the support lifetimes, right. So officially, we have. I mean, JDK eight was sort of retro retroactively put into the into the LTS model. But current, currently active LTSs are 8, 11, 17, and 21. Right. And um, the next one is going to be 25, which is, oh, I, uh, it's coming up with any, I mean, they're only every two years now. So um, so, so that's a lot. And so I think the, the question is, if you, if, you have a, if you have a library and you, you want to support as many customers as possible, so should you... And I think the, the approach that a lot of library developers have taken, not unreasonably, is right. to say, I'm going to compile on the oldest release I support, and, which is probably JDK 8 at this point. Oh, and, no, we're 17, just Java 17, yeah. or bus. Oh, really? OK, well, see, this is, yeah, OK. So, so there, there are different ways to approach this. But I know there are, there, I mean, and, and this, is, this is one of the tough things, which is, um, uh, <clears throat> Well, I'll get to that in a minute, right? So, yeah. so one approach is compile on the oldest release that you support, for example, JDK 8, and then rely on compatibility for that to, um, to continue to run on all subsequent releases. And that's okay. not, uh, I mean, that's not unreasonable, but yeah. it, does, it does constrain you in some ways, right? So for instance, you can't, you can't use any new features. Yeah. In any newer release than JDK eight, okay. Um, and what you can, and I don't, I don't know. You know, you say you you guys have baselined on JDK seventeen now. So what that means is you are leaving behind anybody who's not on JDK seventeen. But, I like to say that we're pulling them forward. We're not, no, you know, we're we're gonna help them come forward. By the way, speaking of support, we sell support for people who are using older. Spring Boot 2.x Java 8 uh, things as well, but it's not open source supported at all. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that's sort of tip and tail right there, which yeah. is the new stuff runs on the newer JDK releases. And then, of course, you maintain old support with no new features, but maybe bug fixes and probably security fixes for the yeah. older version of your framework on older JDK releases. And that's basically what it is. Now, you you guys are a commercial organization, and so you can you you know you know you can staff up to to maintain multiple release streams. Um, well, but yeah, but yeah, even there, it's not something we like to do. You know, we'd like to keep it as well, small. Yeah, obviously, but but there, there's a cost, but it's also a cost you're willing to bear, right? And you're you know, and I think you guys are doing exactly the same thing we are at Oracle, which is it's like okay, well, we want to put a certain amount of effort into the new stuff, but we also need to maintain maintain the old stuff for our customers. Um, yeah. And for the most part, I think we've been able to hold the line on saying, if you're, if, you're, if you're maintaining old systems, that's great. We will support you. But also, we're not pushing new features into the old system. Right, yeah. No backports to major things. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, every so often, there are exceptions to that. And we did, <laughs> like, you know, there are some times when we did have to backport new features, like when uh, uh, when the Japanese uh, received a new emperor. You know oh. about that? <laughs> oh, because the year or something like that is tied to yeah. that, right? The Japanese the Japanese calendar is based on the 
the the the era oh. emperor and we had to go and go back and make api changes to support the new emperor in japan and that uh -huh. fortunately does not happen too often long live the emperor yes uh, of course but but when it does old things do need to be updated so we will make exceptions for things like that um there do, there do you ever watch uh dave's garage on youtube it's a no, no i don't know that it's a former microsoft software microsoft windows software guy no. Dave Plummer, I think his name is, and uh, he he was he had a uh, Raymond Chen on his show at one on one episode, and uh, this is these are old like Windows wonks from like the nineties talking about uh, their work. Yeah, Raymond Chen, I've read some of his his stuff about Microsoft. Microsoft. Right, yeah, he's, yeah. He's, they're both really interesting people to listen to. I'm not a Windows guy; wouldn't touch it with a ten foot pole. I'm definitely not a C plus plus or C guy, but but it's just interesting to hear a really grizzled. Uh, veterans talk about their stuff which is why i love talking to you by the way but but anyway they, they were talking about how at some point they may in the very beginning the time zone selector widget in the ui had a map and you'd, you'd mouse over to a particular region of the map select it and that would be your time zone but of course that ran afoul of lots of different jurisdictions they were just based basing it on the un the united nations sort yeah. of uh, jurisdictions but of course all these countries were up in arms because oh, no, you're not respecting our sovereign borders and all this. And it was just such a thankless job that, you know, all they were trying to do is to set people's time. And yeah. now they, they apparently in some countries, it's even illegal. They have, you have to have a label that says this map is wrong. <laughs> if you show anything besides the one that they allow, you know, right, right. Um, uh, yeah. so it's one of those things where it's like, ah, oh, you time, it always gets us. Well, do, all right. Do do you, do you want an old Sun War story? Yes, but one one other thing. Do you remember two thousand and four, whatever it was, two thousand five? George Bush, uh, under his, he changed time zone TZ data. Do you remember that time zone data? Yeah, Got yeah. Way and the whole country was like, it it was so quick. Suddenly, like everybody had to do service releases, and there was just a weird few months where I remember software just being random blow ups because suddenly their TZ data was out of date. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Some more stories. I love those. Go on. Carry on. Okay. All right. So this is this is way before Java. All right. So this is back right. in SunOS and Solaris days. Okay. Oh. So in the old days, like SunOS three and maybe SunOS four, mm -hmm. basically, um, this was before the system was internationalized, and so um, so basically, we delivered the um, uh, we delivered the OS, and it worked in you know, the United States. And yeah. after a fair amount of effort, we made everything 8-bit clean. Remember that? And so when it was 8-bit clean, we supported Western European countries with all those those weird accented characters, right? right. And there was this, you know, anyway. So, um, so what did we do for Japan and China? Well, what we did, what we, Sun, did was... Uh, either I don't know if it was done in-house or we outsourced it to somebody or might I think we had a development group in as part of as part of Sun, but like Sun Japan had an engineering organization that would take the OS release and hack it all up and make it support Japanese. And so of course, this is an enormous amount of work to do for every release, right? So the the Sun the Japan Sun OS release was always nine months behind the U.S. Sun OS release. By which point things have probably changed again. Well, I mean, this was a continuous process, and people knew that this was a problem. But um, right, so so one of the very long term efforts was uh, a thing called single binary worldwide, and so. It, it's basically basic international. I think we're all familiar with it. Maybe we're all familiar with internationalization now. But basically, it's make sure that all code paths can can deal with with uh, any character set, and then pull all is the this, messages out into separate files. What's that? Does this predate uh, sixteen bit Unicode? Oh yes, yes. This was in the nineteen nineties. Oh yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, this was this was old stuff, right? But and and this is you know yeah this predates Unicode and this is when there were the the character sets were chaos. I mean there was ISO Latin stuff and then Japan had EUC and Shift GIS and I think Big Five was what was Big Five? I forget. You know one of the Asian Asian yeah. character sets. Anyway, so there was this is this is kind of pre Unicode, but people were working on Unicode at the time, but it wasn't yeah. 
there yet. But basically, the idea was internationalize the code so that all code paths were uniform and that messages could be plugged in and you know date and time formatting could be plugged in. Make sure that all of that stuff was pluggable. So you can deliver a single binary, and then a localization center could just update the messages and crank out the localization in a very <laughs> short amount of time. So, and, and actually, in fact, what we did, we got to the point, this is when we delivered software on CD-ROMs. That was a big advance uh, when we gravitated from, from tape to CD-ROM. And we eventually did realize this goal, which was to put all of SunOS and something like 14 supported localizations on the same CD-ROM. So we could ship the same, the same product worldwide. And that, that, that was an enormous hmm. amount of effort. Well, um, and so I don't think pe maybe people listening don't quite understand. At the time, I mean, Java has, a, it had Unicode basically from the get-go. Yeah. And so you could always do internationalized text from, with Java since the 96 or whatever. But back then, you might have to have a different, uh, well, if it's C, you would have a different uh, type def and alias yeah, to hold that data, it would be a different kind of string. You'd have like five different strings in a given program. Yeah, um, so this, some of which this, were unicode. Or yeah, this was code. early '90s stuff. Yeah, uh, so this was fancy. This is old. Sorry, I'm old now, right? But, oh no, but I'm I'm just going to explain to people. This was yeah, it's yeah, not I know. just like it's you have to write a new C string. You know, you have to write a new thing so that you can deal with this. It's really not right. as easy as it sounds. Right. Okay. So so in the sometime in the '90s. Um, we were able to get a single binary worldwide for Solaris and include all the localizations on it. So, so, and then of course there's manufacturing because we need to stamp out 10,000 CDs and all the artwork and, and stuff like that. So there's actual manufacturing to deal with that. There was a yeah. problem. Uh -oh. There are two countries that call themselves China. Okay, yeah, Republic of. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And um, there was a problem because one of the Chinas did did not uh, did not like the fact that uh, uh, the the product that they they were asked to distribute acknowledged the existence of the other China. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh. so, so, yeah. so in fact, all the technology that went into uh, single binary, single CD-ROM, single single SKU for worldwide Solaris. Uh, was uh, was prevented. Uh, now all the technology was still there, and all that was worth an investment. But uh, uh, and I don't know how far it went. But uh, yeah. but the fact is, we we still had to list separate products for different parts of the world, and this was not a technological issue. This is literally a political issue. Geopolitical issues. They, sometimes they trump everything. Um, That's right. Which which gets us to another point, which is a uh, like you've obviously been in the sun. Well, you you were part of Sun, uh, yeah. pulling out the Sun. Uh, you're 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 now at Oracle, which means you've been there since at least two thousand and eight. Uh, so that makes this sixteen years. Um, and then you were at Sun, obviously, for a good uh, fifteen years or so before that. It sounds like. Um, yeah. What like why 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 join why did you join Sun instead of becoming a rich handsome billionaire? Like, what was the <laughs> feels like you had options and you know you could have. What, what's your path in life? Like, how'd you get here? Why are you doing Java now instead of, I don't know, lecturing about? Well, uh, so so uh, at at the at the times where I had choice, <laughs> at the times where I had choices, I did not know that the the path to becoming a rich, handsome billionaire were open to me. Uh, so that's, <laughs> that's the short answer to that. Um, uh, yeah, so I joined Sun in 1986. Uh, so yeah, that was a that was a while ago. Um, and, um, and actually, and this was, you know, and this was, this was pretty cool, right? My first, so I was fresh out of school, but my first job at Sun was working with James Gosling on the news window system. I don't know if you remember that. That was the, the window system with PostScript in it. Oh, um, oh, like next step. Nice. Yeah. Well, great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I guess you could, I guess you could say it's like next step. But anyway, so that was really cool. Right? But um, um, that's really cool. You know, there there's a certain amount of inertia, but there also I've been able to find projects 
within Sun and then now at Oracle that I thought were interesting and worthwhile and, um, you know, let me pursue my career. So um, I think I've been been lucky to be able to find things, um, you know, find different things while staying in the same company. Well, so when you were in college, you studied computer science or something like that, right? Whatever they called it at the time. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. And you were doing, I guess, it sounds like you were doing C and C++ and assembler and operating system stuff, right? Not, not to, obviously Java's 10 years out at that point, right? Right. Um, right. So, like, and you were doing that, and were you working in graphics, compositing, windowing, or, like, kernel stuff? Or what was your... What was your thing that you did? What would I have interviewed you about if I was doing this interview? Oh, 40? yeah. So early on, I, I wasn't doing graphics graphics, but I did graphics and user interfaces. So that's why I ended up working on the Windows system stuff. So yeah. it, was, it was it was a little bit of graphics at the pixel level, but more, more um, graphical stuff at a higher level. It's like, yeah. um, so... So I worked on window manager stuff. I worked on some toolkit stuff, you know. Um, That's amazing. Did you yeah. ever work on the, on the swing stuff? Um, no, I actually never worked on swing. Oh. Um, so I kind of gravitated away. Do you remember? I don't know. And so I never worked on any Windows. Window, I, I never worked on any window systems in Java. Yeah. Uh, Kind of moved on from that, so I don't know if you remember that. So I worked on the news stuff. I worked on the X window system. Right. Um, there was this. Uh, there was you know open look, open windows, uh, right. e motif, that stuff. That was you said motif UI, which lives on in Linux for reasons I'll never understand. Uh, <laughs> it was it was fine at the time. I just yeah just the, yeah um, yeah motif huh. Cool. Just, well, so what was the motif? The postscript thing is kind of interesting to me. Really, that is interesting to me. Why? Yeah. why what was the? Because I, I remember in the eighties, desktop publishing got real big, right? And uh, right. Adobe had this postscript thing, and uh, you know, you could one bit of rendering code, you could image the same thing across all printers, and it was yeah, it was lunacy. You know, the idea was, it was impossible. It would never work, right? But of course, it, it's the only thing that works now. But yeah, um, like why? What made you? Was it was your effort completely unrelated to next steps, or was theirs based on yours, or vice versa? Like, right. why just why display Postscript? Like, who who who? So so <laughs> so news was not actually display Postscript TM. Uh, mm -hmm. Display Postscript was an Adobe thing. Um, okay. And our, so so news was uh, um, uh, was James Gosling's idea. That's so cool. Yeah. Doing, doing cool things yeah. 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the problem, the problem there is um, when you're, which is probably mostly solved now. And I kind of lost the, um, uh, I, I've I've lost track of what's going on in in Windows and graphics today. But nowadays, there's things like OpenGL and and sure. um, <clears throat> you know Wayland and compositing stuff and all the stuff. But but back then, um, everything was pixel based. Yeah. And, uh, so in fact, X is, is very much pixel based. And, um, so if you, and one of the problems was, uh, dealing with resolution. And so, yeah. you know, in those days, if everything was 72 dots per inch, then, um, you could draw some buttons and render a font in it and it would work. Okay. Um, but if you switch to a higher resolution screen, then everything, everything, would just get too small to read. So okay. what do you do about that? Oh, okay, well, all right. So we have a bunch of fonts and fonts were all bitmapped at the time. So choose a bigger font, right? So then you'd have to get people to, to draw fonts at a whole bunch of different sizes and, and so forth. Um, yeah. And so what PostScript did was <clears throat> basically it had an abstract coordinate system. Yeah. And it, was, it could be scaled to, to any resolution. Um, and it also had scalable fonts. Yeah. And so in principle, you could have um, you could have actually if you 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 could just scale the display and everything would get bigger or smaller, or you could even rotate it or put it backwards. And we had a lot of fun doing that kind of stuff. Um, it's, just, it's just vectors, right? Like that's really nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
the 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 problem was I think it was a little bit ahead of its time because the fact is in the late 80s and early 90s most of the screens were in fact 72 spots per inch and so right. it was any rendering artifacts really uh, really made things um, kind of difficult so so there was uh, there was a lot of <clears throat> you could draw things in postscript but at at those at effectively what were low resolutions they didn't look that good. Um, well, also, I think the very large majority of people are still using amber screens, right, uh, or green screens. So I, yeah. Like, well, yeah. I mean, uh, no. I think I think by the end of the '80s, I mean that was the whole thing about Sun workstations was that basically you had everything. Everything was graphics oriented. Yeah. You, you know, there. Sure, there were applications that were that were just you know text based and whatnot, but right. that's. that's that's what we were targeting towards. But at yeah. the time, the graphics were really, you know, fairly low resolution compared to what we have today. Um, so, so I think there was this promise of scalability and resolution independence, but it wasn't, it wasn't really realized. Um, it wasn't really realizable at the time. Yeah. I think. Pity. It was a, that. Those were some exciting times. I do remember. I yeah. didn't. I never. I never had the privilege of using news, but I do remember sitting down and using a next. Using next. For the very first time and having two audio files playing at the same time for no reason at all you know or <laughs> and then also the idea that i could have a it, we didn't have pdf then but you know encapsulated postscript right or you could you could write out a file that was a spitting image of what you had just rendered in right some <clears throat> you know it's just a, now it's like oh of course you can do that but back then oh my god you know and well okay so there's an interesting um in, in, interesting bit of uh uh, an interesting retrospective here and a bit of commonality with other things going on, right? So one of the things about PostScript is, so PostScript is a fourth-like programming language. I don't know if you've actually ever programmed in PostScript, but I've, yeah. it's, it's actually programmable. And yeah. at the time, we all thought this was really cool. Um, and there are certain things that were cool about it, no question. And so evolutions of that, such as encapsulated PostScript and uh, PDF, yeah, actually, still retain those features. Somewhere at the bottom, there's actually some executable code that's interpreted. Right. And nowadays, that's a real problem because PDFs are now a vehicle for for malware. All right. And yeah, of course. I, it's been so long since I thought about that, but yeah, I guess so. So, so you really want something that's more purely declarative, like SVG. Yeah. Okay. And then the bit of commonality is, remember, the or origin of Java is to have a much more structured means of moving executable code around, except right. that it's it's not a bunch of text which is using like a fourth-like interpreter. It's now a class file. But right. remember, the origins of Java were, oh, well, you know, you can you can send a class over to the browser and have the browser execute it safely. Right. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that brings us back around to our discussion around security managers and applets and all these other yeah. since related things. Um, huh, I remember that. It was a, uh, fun times. I, I, I remember uh, Remy, our friend Remy Forex, he did a, uh, no, not Forex, the other one in Montreal. The, uh, he did a great demo for Java 1 one year. We took code from Windows 95 and Java 1 and got it running in a virtual machine on modern day oh. computer. It's the same networking code. Do you remember this? It was like a. No, I don't remember this one. Um, yeah, it just, I did. It was. It brought. I still think about it a lot because it brought back a lot of memories of like yeah. first time I ever saw a Java applet with ought spin up and do the right thing. You know, like a uh, ought was. It blew my mind at the time. You know, it did. It looked pretty good on Windows. Everything else kind of. Yeah. Well, it, it needed a little bit of extra help there, but. You know, it was great. Like I couldn't believe it. Now here we are. It's just we're spoiled for choice, obviously. And you mentioned SVG, which has JavaScript, so you can program uh, SVGs now. Actually, that's and that's oh, really? even. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, whatever. Um. So okay. So so you you left. You were you were at Sun. You're working on the operating system stuff and graphics. You worked on like what what's the, I'm trying to figure out how you went from there to like taking people's toys in 2024. Like what's I, what's your path? Oh. Where you were? 
<laughs> oh, well, okay. So, I mean, you know, how do you do this? So I did work on various windows, various aspects of the window system and, and desktop for, for a number of years. I had a few years where I worked on some e-commerce stuff that was in the right. late nineties. So I was using Java in the late nineties, although I didn't work on Java. We actually heard okay. uh, some e-commerce. It never, it never really went anywhere, but we did a lot of Java programming at the time back in the Java 1.0 days. So that was, mm. that was uh, interesting, uh, interesting education. Um, Question, what did you use? Oh, actually, what was your editor? Did you use like Turbo Pascal in the eighties or what would you, what was your IDE of choice? IDE? Um, weapon of choice. Uh, yeah. Max. Um, um, actually, but it's interesting. Uh, it's funny. I, I was probably a dedicated Emacs user for 20 oh, years. Oh, Emacs? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, good. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I... But, nice. but actually, you know, what's interesting is over time, I, I gravitated over to using NetBeans. And, and now that you ask the question, it's like, Oh, I, I forget the time. I forget the last time I actually ran Emacs. So for I, I in the okay, there's no question. If you're writing Java code, you should use a Java editor because there's nothing, not even Visual Studio Code, nothing even comes close. It, their, their Visual Studio is 20 years behind us in terms of the complete insane mind reading uh, magic that is the modern IDE is just so far beyond amazing at this point that I, you know, I, but, but for everything else, I use Emacs, right? So um, I don't, well, I guess if I'm writing a giant program in Python or something, maybe I'll use a uh, high charm, but I wrote my last book in Emacs, for example, right? Oh, wow. Okay. It was a great uh, plugin for ASCII doctor. And, you know, you can set that up and I use that to, when I write blogs and whenever I, I'll open up uh, Emacs most of the time. I, Emacs is great. I love Emacs. And, Nowadays, there's NeoVim, and I've been tempted. I've been tempted to maybe try that out because NeoVim seems like it's a, a growing fast enough. But VI used to be, I mean, there was like, you know, we, we poked fun at Java 6 to 7, or sorry, yeah, 6 to 7, where there was like five years. There was like a nine-year gap between one of the VI releases. So, you know, whereas Emacs keeps evolving and having new things, and it's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big Emacs fan. That's a, and, and sure, I might say that because you and I are actually just, Running in Henri Tremblay, yes. Thank you, Maurice. I got the I got the wrong. It wasn't Remy. It was Henri Tremblay, who was on the show. That is so embarrassing. I completely forgot his name. All right, Henri. Yes, he was the one who did the keynote where with the old uh, backported um, Java code from 1.0 or whatever Windows 95 um, that ran today. Uh, thank you, Maurice. Um, but anyway, like I, I uh, uh, what was I saying? We're talking about Emacs and Vim oh, yeah. and oh, yeah. Emacs is great. I, I'm people po poke fun at it, but it, I, the reason I might the, maybe the reason I like it so much is because at the end of the day, you and I are just processes running in the giant Emacs universal. Uh, <laughs> world, you know, we are. It's, of course, we like it. It's it's kind of true because even though I I might not have run Emacs itself for for some time. The the usual key bindings like Control N, Control P, Control F, Control B right. for for navigating those still roll off the fingers, and a lot of right. things still still use them. And so so I f I find myself using those unconsciously, and they still work. I think they still work in NetBeans. I think they work in Apple's text editor, and and so so those Emacs bindings, the Emacs lives on even though the process is not actually running at the moment. It does, and and actually that's the, that's what's making NeoVim so interesting is. They have the, it's obviously it's a totally separate thing, but the fact that everybody can also support the Vim bindings, the Vim motions, they call them, right? The way you move around code yeah. with VI. Uh, well, that's pretty, apparently people say the best way to get into VI, because I really never got into it. The best way they say to get into VI is to like switch on Vim emulation in IntelliJ, for example, or <laughs> Vision Code. Because... The, you can separate the the tool from the the navigation, and the, the, they yeah. call them Vim motions. Yeah. Um, and I've got Emacs motions or whatever that equivalent is called. I know those like like you do. Probably not nearly so well as you, but I, I, I you know, I've written literally five hundred pages of book in. If you've written that Emacs. much, you certainly know the bindings pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Okay. You know. But uh, yeah, it's a. I I don't know. Anyway, Emacs lives lives on. It'll never die. I, I love Emacs. Oh, good. And it changes. So people, there's always something. You can run, the, you know, the language server, somebody, uh, so 
the Red Hat puts out the Java language server. By the way, Oracle has one. I forgot about that. Oracle has a, I, I, I mentioned it like six months ago. Oracle has a language server based on NetBeams or Visual Studio Code, right? Um, I wonder yeah, that... I don't know that much about it. But yeah, so VS Code has plugins. And yeah. um, the, uh, so, and so NetBeans, so it's not, it's not, it's not based on NetBeans per se, but the, so one of the components of NetBeans is, right. is um, <clears throat> something that embeds Java C itself. So it actually does the correct, uh, correct parsing. So right. you can actually, actually get uh, a valid parse tree out of Java. Um, so, so that, that, uh, that works underneath NetBeans. And so, um, so what they did is they took that component of NetBeans and turned it into a VS code plugin for Java. I did try it for, I, yeah. So I'm kind of keen to see, I don't know if you can speak to any of this, but I'm keen to see, um, because right now there's this very, it, behind the scenes, Visual Studio Code has this thing called a language server. Basically yeah. it's a protocol. Another Java, another process, be it in C or Java or Python or whatever, spins up and it communicates over this protocol to Visual Studio Code. And so it is just a protocol. And in theory, any IDE or any text editor that, that speaks that protocol can now incorporate those things as plugins. So that said, there are Emacs. You can you can use Java from Emacs and get the same Java IDE experience that you get from um, Eclipse is the original one, but now there's this. Like you said, there's one from Oracle that I would love to see work in Emacs. I haven't even tried making it work. I wonder what it would look like. Yeah, huh. that's interesting. Yeah, it's really, I mean, that's why I love uh, like our open source community is because it's not hard to do that. I mean, it is, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying you can do it technically. Whereas before it might've been a political discussion 30 years ago, you know? Um, yeah. um, okay, so you so so then you moved to NetBeams and you just, you've been there ever since because it's awesome? Uh. Oh, you mean in terms of you being uh, as a user of NetBeans? Yeah. 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 Um, okay. And so, okay, you did e-commerce, and then. Like, okay. So so now okay so now we're switching back to my career. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. that project came to an end, and I started looking around inside of Sun uh, for another job, and I found a job in the Java ME organization. Your <gasps> Java ME? Yes. Yes, of course. And there was um a preprocessor that was a third party thing to support it was actually if def basically for java <laughs> because you know you'd use java me and it would be one profile and it didn't support like floating points for example and then you'd use another and it did and you wanted to have like uh code what was that third party processor i remember getting deep in the weeds on that java me preprocessor yeah um, i don't know sure I mean, we did have a preprocessor for other reasons, but but no. The thing about Java ME was that it was supposed to be a subset of um, of the big Java, which is what we call the JDK now, or Java mm -hmm. SE, Java Standard Edition. Um, yeah. But um, all all of the subsetting work was manual, which turned out to be a uh, a real problem <laughs> um, because. Uh, it's not that difficult to take a platform and strip out stuff that you think is is not necessary, um, and you know there's a certain amount of work to make sure that the that the I mean obviously if you if you strip out some stuff and some parts depend on pieces that are no longer there the thing won't compile, um, right. but uh, stripping out stripping out stuff to make it small but leaving stuff there in order to make it sufficient for writing the programs you want to be able to write right was somewhat difficult and so also in java me we 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 ended up adding purpose-built apis uh, and that's what i did with the the java me there was this there was a, a profile called mid p the mobile information device profile right so the user interface apis for that so I did do, I, I, I take that back, what I said earlier, I didn't do any user interface stuff for, for Java. I did, but it was all in the Java ME space. And it was completely separate from AWT and Swing. So. Um, <clears throat> I used your stuff. I, I built a, I had an old uh, flip phone, which was. Oh, yeah. And it, it ran Java ME, but then I also got, I, I downgraded in a sense that I went to a, um, Trio, 
Yeah. Right? Which didn't support Java ME, or at least the one I didn't, when I had, but it supported uh, Qualcomm Brew. Do you remember this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I remember Brew was one, one of our competitors, the Java ME. So you actually uh, used MidP, huh? Oh, I'm sorry yeah. to hear that. <laughs> well, no, I was, I mean, to me, this is the precursor to like, this all was like five yeah. years before Android and iOS and all that stuff changed the, yeah. the damn world. It was just a little ahead of its time, you know? Um, yeah, amazing. But it's so cool. It's so cool. Uh, and that was another, did you use a security manager? I don't remember, but I remember there was very, it was very, you couldn't just make a, you couldn't just get a GPS signal and take a photo. It was a, uh, they had. Uh, so, in the, so there were actually two, there was kind of the, the small Java ME and the medium sized Java ME. Uh, right. And so I think the medium sized Java ME might have had a security manager, but I worked on the smaller one, which did not. Okay. So the, the um, yeah, the small, the small version of Java ME really threw out a lot of stuff. Um, so there was no security manager, no, no class loader. Um, no floating no, point. Uh, no, it did have floating point. Oh, uh, what am I thinking of that? Yeah. I remember like some basic types weren't even there. Um, um, it's been 25 years. I don't know. Yeah, I forget exactly what uh, what was missing. Um, no, I mean that was all. You know, I think the problem was it was all also all based on on. Uh, well, I know they threw out most of the collections. So right. the 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 only collections you had were vector and hashable. Yeah. Yeah. The old level one collection types, yeah. none of the DU2 types. The, the legacy, the so-called legacy collections, yeah. Right. And that's not the new vector, that's the old one that you can still use in Java. Um, Java vector, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do remember that. Okay. Well, that's amazing. So you worked on that. That's so cool. Thank you for that. It was great. I was I was really uh I felt like this is one of those things where Java just took you places that nothing else could at the time, you know. That was neat. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was pretty cool. Um, what? I, that's a shame. I mean, was there? I remember Android came out and it kind of just sucked up all the oxygen in the room. And uh, you know, there was even some people from the Java team that ended up working, like our old friend Chet Haas. He's a he just retired yeah. from Google. Yeah, um, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's some people that ended up working on Android, and it's just like, well, this is right. yeah, a bunch of the bunch of the Swing team ended up going over there. Yeah. <clears throat> oh well. Yeah, I think Sun. There were some. Well, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but there were some. There were some management. Uh, there were some management issues at Sun in the um, during the two thousands. Yeah, and um, and I think um, one is that uh, that led to the departure of a lot of people. Actually, it was the Java FX stuff. The um, right. the Java FX stuff led to a lot of departures from the Swing team. Um, but actually, before that, I think there were some management issues where we we evolved Java ME to a certain point, but at a certain point, we we couldn't make any decisions about how to move the product forward. Um, oh, that's a bummer. Yeah, so there was a lot of a bummer yeah. headism. Uh, that's a shame. That's a, it's a pity because it was really great. It was really good, and uh, yeah. Java FX now, of course, is uh, like I, I wish it was a little bit more library like instead of control everything like. Yeah. But um, like it, once they got rid of Java FX script, I think I remember thinking, oh, this could go somewhere. I could actually see people <laughs> using this, you know. And it's, uh, it's I mean, it's not worse than what's out there right now for Windows and for uh, you know, do you ever flex Macromedia? Adobe Flex and things like that. I remember, I remember thinking, "Gee, this Java thing really could be a contender if we kind of got out of our own way a little bit." <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so you were working on the Java and me stuff that went, I guess that went somewhere, and you you didn't follow. Where'd you go? Uh, so I did work on Java FX for a while. Uh, I did mention Java FX script. And that was, you know, and that's kind of interesting. There are a couple, couple folks still on the team who used to. Well, you know, Brian, Brian Getz actually did the. Uh, what did he do? Should I have passed? Should I put some salt in my foot and <laughs> that's in my mouth now? <laughs> no. Hear what his? That's actually. I mean, I Brian. Brian was around in the Java community, and I was acquainted with him. 
um, before that, but he actually joined Sun to work on. Well, he actually joined Sun for one reason, and then was was uh, was reorged into Java FX. And I think he, um, I think he did the Java. He, I think he either did the Java FX compiler or the Java FX language definition or something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's part of Brian's history, and maybe he doesn't want to talk about it anymore. I don't know. Um, it was it was a valid effort. I just think it was yeah. not what we needed. We had this really nice language, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. And then what was the other uh, the other thing? Oh, Jim Lasky. So there's another another guy. I don't know if you know Jim Lasky. He uh, he did, he did uh, string um, uh, string. He's doing string templates. And what's the other thing he did? He did the multi line. String stuff. I forget. Oh, um, um, I use that every day. I use that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Jim, Jim has done a whole bunch of string stuff. It's amazing. Here it is. We've been we've been programming computers for sixty or seventy years now, and string is still an unsolved problem. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, the multi line strings are because it was when it first came out. I'm like, oh well, great. My SQL statements just got a lot easier to write. But now we have LLM prompts. So every day I've got some like program that's talking to an LLM, you know. Okay. That's fun. yeah. Anyway, and then I'm looking for the looking forward to the string templates. Okay, carry on, Jim Nasky. Yeah. Anyway, so he he did he did a lot of work on the Java FX script compiler as well. Um, but so cool. but you know, I mean, my I I don't know. I've I I have a bunch of misgivings about the whole Java FX. That one is it was there was a lot of chaos at Sun and and the Java FX. Well, the Java FX name got applied to a whole bunch of different things that were completely unrelated, which is yeah. which was a typical Sun thing to do at the time. Maybe it happens in other companies. Microsoft, um, remember .NET was on like their win, their login, yeah, .NET yeah. login, .NET services, .NET this, .NET that. Yeah. Not just the framework, you know? Yeah. And uh, at the time, Jonathan mm -hmm. Schwartz applied the name Java to a bunch of things that didn't have anything to do with Java. Remember that? And he was a stock ticker. The stock ticker symbol, yes. <laughs> oh my God, I remember reading the newspaper. I'm like, what am I reading? What the heck? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so there was that, but um, you know, and I, I, I don't know what Jim and Brian think. Maybe they might agree, but the whole effort into trying to bring up an entirely different programming language, yeah, was, was mostly wasted, and nice. it was, yeah, um, and it was really painful to. Essentially, get rid of it, um, but but actually, I think that was necessary, and and I think the the uh, uh, I think what I what I think is the most valuable part of Java FX that remains today is this concept of a scene graph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Java FX, with the compositing layer. Yeah, yeah. Like and um, the graphics guys who who worked on that initially really knew what they were doing. Yeah. Um, and so there was a lot of, a lot of stuff there, but, uh, anyway, so, so that was, you know, and it was kind of interesting building a user interface on top of that. Right. Um, right. And, and it was also very postscript like, because you could have a path in there and you could say, okay, well here, here are these, here are these points that define a path. And then you could either, you, you could fill the path, you could stroke the path, or you could use this path as uh, a clip. So, thing, yeah. yeah, so so yeah, it was all it was I, I thought the graphic stuff was the most powerful thing. And then I think we were <clears throat> there were some cool things about Java FX script, but um ultimately I think the problem the problem was that that language was it was designed from a standpoint of wouldn't it be cool if <laughs> I it's so, a the, well, first of all, obviously, Brian and others have since gone on to make Java a much more yes. powerful yeah. language to the point where I think you could get close enough to, like, all you would need is a library for the bindings, right? That's the only thing that wouldn't be a language-native thing from Java FX script, it seems to me. That and maybe there was a, I think there's some, was there comprehensions or is that just Python? There's something like um, that. For well, so, so there were some nice things about Java FX, which was the... Uh, what do they call them? Those are the, they had this the special form of constructors that you could nest arbitrarily that were kind of like like um, object literals. I think we called right, them like a markup for designing UIs. 
Yeah, it was it was almost markup. Well, so it wasn't literally markup like. It was really right. executable, but it it was it was it was all nested. And if you looked at it the right way, it you could it looked declarative. But in okay. fact, it was actually evaluating. It was just nested constructors. Right. <laughs> um, but but that was that was real that was actually quite good for creating a whole bunch of user interface objects. For sure. Yeah. Um, uh, and so you know, it would be interesting to revisit something like that. Um, but the other thing about this was, you know, you mentioned binding, right? And so, so um, when when they first saw binding, I think everybody thought, oh, how that that's cool because, like in in AWT and Swing, if you wanted user presses a button and you wanted to affect something else in the user interface, you have to right. manually wire up all this stuff. Yeah, like, listeners and all that. Yeah. You press this, you have an action that goes off and finds this other thing and does such and so, such and so. And then with binding, you can say, "Oh, I can have this value depend on that value," and mm -hmm. it gets it gets updated automatically. Right. So I think there are two fundamental problems with that. One is that it's impossible to keep track of the dependencies between different pieces of your program. Right. And and since it's impossible to keep track of those dependencies order of evaluation ambiguities inevitably creep in. And we had some terrible problems debugging that. It was awful. The second thing is the, the, the notion of, of changing one value and then having that value depended on by a bind is a side effect. Right. So the entire computation of pro your program is a cascade of side effects, yep. which is just terrible. It's a yeah, terrible yeah. program. <laughs> right. That's what I'm saying. It gets better as a lag. So by the way, this is again, so people who don't know, JavaFX was what, 2005, the original one? Like a long time ago, guess what they're just figuring out in JavaScript? They're just figuring There's this framework called Svelte, S-V-E-L-T-E. And okay. it has a compiler that lets you do exactly what you just described from uh, JavaFX, where you had a binding. So, yeah. but it's a compiler, so the compiler can see that this thing is being dependent on by that, um, as opposed to all the stuff you do in React and Vue and all these other web frameworks to uh, to like use effect. Basically, you're saying I've got a thing that when something changes, I want this listener to be called. But you get this really sort of, well, I changed this that triggered a cascade, and you know it gets really complicated. And this is why people make jokes about React being so complicated is because it's almost impossible. To, after a while, the abstraction grows to such catastrophic complexity that like, I'm going to breathe on this component and see what the hell happens. I'm not sure if my browser will, <laughs> will fall over or if everything will be OK. We'll find out, you know? Yeah. So now they've got compilers helping you write. Like, they're hacking the JavaScript compiler and yeah. transpiling it for you so that when you change something, there's a well-understood idea of, well, I mean, to the extent that that's even possible, there's a well understood graph, you know. Uh, yeah, 2024. This is 20 years later. I mean, JavaFX script. When did JavaFX come out? It's got to be mid 2000s, right? Like it was the late 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A long time ago. 2005 to 2010. I I forget. I think I I worked on it from like 2007 to to 2010 or so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Or uh, about side effects. And, and evaluate. Want to hear a war story about uh, side effects and order of evaluation dependencies? So, yeah. um, and actually, this is this is pretty good because some of the same people are still around. I mentioned um, Brian Getz and Jim Lasky. So Jim Lasky actually wrote the comp compiler that handled the binding stuff in, in JavaFX yeah. script, and Kevin Rushforth, who was still working on JavaFX, it, was working on the scene graph at the time. Oh and, wow! Thank you. For uh, that. Yeah, so it's it's really cool that there are uh, still still folks from those days still around. But uh, mm -hmm. but anyway, we were um, working on uh, we were working on uh, Java FX, and um, uh, we had uh, uh, we had this thing which was the equivalent of Swing Set, which was kind of our uh, shakedown test. Uh, we called mm -hmm. it small, but it was it was sort of the, the Java FX equivalent of of Swing Set. Basically, a little window with one of every widget, and so. Um, <clears throat> So we were uh, we were about we had a re we we were basically we got to the point where you know we were 
we were about to produce our, our we had I think we had produced our release candidate build. Um, oh, right. sorry. Okay, background. Okay, so and this is this ah boy how times have changed. This is when most of the team was in one office, or at least right. a few offices, and so um, one day. So sorry, rewind before uh, our release candidate. Okay, so sometime in the middle of development, you know, somebody would make a change, and right. um, you know, typically you would you know run the unit tests, you'd run uh, you'd run ensemble, make sure that you didn't break the user interface and whatnot, um, and then you know check in the code. Okay, um, one guy uh, built you know you know made a change in in some piece of code, built the system, and he brought up uh, ensemble. And the user interface was just wrong. Like things were out of alignment. Uh, he could click in a text field, but the blinking cursor, you know, you have a text field, the blinking cursor is supposed to be right there, but it was like right. over here. And he could still type, but the, the text appeared up here instead. But it was okay. still, everything was, it was in the wrong location. There was some weird layout problem. Um, so, you know, Apple just had a bug like that. Oh, really? Literally, the last few weeks it got fixed. It's funny you should mention that. Um, yeah. All right. Well, so I'll try to <laughs> make this. Anyway, so it's sort of, well, that's weird. So he 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 backed out his change and then recompiled and it okay. went away. Okay. And then he put his change back in and recompiled and he didn't see the problem again. What? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's like, but, you know, word of a few people saw this phenomenon and word got around. It's like, yeah, it's weird. You, you know, something weird happened, but then I recompiled and it went away, right? And it's like, huh, how could that happen, right? But it, it, it didn't happen very often, but it happened often enough that we were aware that it was a phenomenon. And then it huh. happened to somebody again, and we spent a couple hours trying to debug it, and we could not figure it out. And, you know, so we squirreled away that binary, and the guy just recompiled, and the problem went away. And we're looking at this and it's like, ah, oh, I don't know. What are we gonna do about this? You know, so the problem is there's definitely a problem there, but we also don't know what to do about it. So mm -hmm. so you know, I remember talking to Kevin about this, and it's like, I'm not sure what we can do at this point. I guess we can just hope that it doesn't happen. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. So we got to the point where we were fixing our bugs and finished our features and we got to release candidate build. And I remember talking to Kevin, he comes walking down the hall. He says, well, it happened. Okay. Our release candidate build had this bug in it. And it was permanently there, it stayed there? Well, it was reproducible, right? Okay. It was definitely a problem with the binary. Yeah. So we could take the same exact sources and um, uh, recompile them, and the problem went away. But the fact is, our official release candidate build had this bug in it, and and so we gathered a bunch of leads together. And we're all shaking our heads, and it's like, all right, well, we were hoping this didn't happen. It happened. We have to deal with it, right? Yeah. So what is this? Well, maybe it's a bug in the compiler, and everybody sort of laughs it off, and it's like, you know. You know, it's always the, the last thing you check for, but the fact is this is a new compiler. And no you know, it's it's always it's always the 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 you know it's it's always the the a junior developer's first you know first place to blame is it must be a compiler bug. But all of us had lots of experience and stuff and we kind of laughed it off. No, it's not a bug in the compiler. Like, well, maybe it is a bug in the compiler. And so <laughs> I said, okay, well, how could we find this out? Well, one thing is, do we actually have reproducible builds? And uh, so uh, uh, I remember talking to Kevin about this. This is, this is great. He says, <laughs> so, so what he did is he hacked up our make files to, so, so we believed that this was, this was definitely in uh, the, the library, the, the library code in Java FX. Right. So he basically hacked up the make file to rebuild the um, uh, the library portion of the Java FX build a hundred times, and you know that didn't take that long. It only took a few minutes, but you know, so you know, 
you know, we talked about this for a while. He says, okay, well, you know, that's that's simple to do and it should only take an hour or two, right? So he, he came back two hours later and said, you know what? Every build is different from every other build. The, the diff file is different? The binaries produced. The digest, okay. Whoa. From the, from the same, okay, from the same source file. Yeah, with the same in, same, same operating system, same input, same everything. Every binary was different from every other binary. And furthermore, he 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 ran he ran our test on on all 100 different binaries, and three of them had the bug. And so it's what? like, okay, there's definitely something going on in the compiler. Oh, <laughs> by the way, kids listening, this is. The apps do not reach for the. This is not a compiler issue. Ninety nine point nine nine percent of the time, it's it just trust me. It's not the compiler, but it can, apparently it sometimes it is. Yeah. Okay. So, so we talked to the compiler guys about it. We went back and forth for a while, and it turns out, and this is this links in one of my other favorite pet peeves, which is iteration order of collections, like like hash maps. Right. So it turns out that the compiler stored its dependencies. Like the compiler compiled the, the bind, the FX script had this had these mechanisms, which we talked about a little while ago, bind and triggers, what we call them. Basically, it had <clears throat> the runtime had to keep track of dependencies between these objects. So if this object changed, then that would that would cause a side effect on this other object. And so in order to evaluate those, it had to maintain a dependency graph. And it stored those dependencies in a hash map. Wow. And that got compiled into the binary. And so it turns out that, sorry, the compiler stored them in a hash map. And then when it generated the code, those the, the contents of the hash map were written out into the binary. Right. And since the hash maps iteration order is Undefined. Uh, is is not is not specified right. then there was some there's something that added some randomness into it and so every time you recompiled you got your dependencies evaluated in a different order and we never proved this but my hunch was that somewhere in our in our fx toolkit we had an order a hidden order of evaluation dependency among our binding dependency graph and most of the time it worked, but if the compiler happened to have things in its internal tables in a different order, it would it would evaluate those dependencies in the wrong in the wrong order, and this bug would manifest. So, what, did you just yeah. change the out change the uh, collection type so it was just predictable ordering, the and then got that? The compiler changed to use linked hash map, and the problem never happened again. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh my God! Oh, see, this is where you to learn your collections, kids. Just pay attention to the type you're using, and that's yeah. You are you are all like gray-haired, grizzled uh, veterans, even then. And the fact that this kind yeah. of bug even gets you sometimes, oh man. Yeah, but but I I I you know it it I'm oh. uh, it's either it's either a bug in the semantics of of the language, or it's a it's it's a it's an order of evaluation dependency in our toolkit. I know we did have other cases though. So, so, um, but we never actually, I mean, the problem, you know, we changed it to a link hash map and the problem went away. And so that was sufficient to deliver our release, but sure. uh, we never actually proved what the root cause was. Um, but my hunch was that it was an order of evaluation dependency of our bind dependencies. Yeah. And so, does it, so did you try compiling it again another hundred times to make sure the MD5 was the same across all the hundred binaries, or what? Yes, our our binaries became reproducible at that point. Oh, thank goodness! Yeah. <laughs> Ollie. Oh, it's so oh man, this is that would haunt me too. Those kind of bugs are the absolute yeah. worst. Oh, that was a for sure. So, <laughs> okay, so then. Uh, where did you? Okay, so they took away JavaFX script, and then you got. You went on like a, a vengeful quest to start deprecating other people's stuff instead. Like, what's like, what's your journey here? You know, what's your uh, how did you become the villain in the story? What happened? 
Uh, well, I think the thing about deprecation is, is <clears throat> I think in general in the, in the industry, people don't think, think enough about, um, um, it's easy to start new projects. It's harder to maintain them and nobody knows what to do with them. Um, nobody knows how to shut projects down. And it's the same way with features, right? It's easy to introduce new features and then maintaining them over time is, is hard. And then, then not enough attention has been paid to um, um, how to remove them. So I think, I think that's, a general, that's a general issue. There are, a lot of, there, there are a lot of things that are simply abandoned, which is, which is just sad. Um, and so I think the honest and responsible thing to do is to say, you know, for, for certain things, that you know this this has outlived its usefulness. It's obsolete, um, but and we're going to take it out of the platform and to try to migrate. You know anybody who's still using it, um, migrate them. You know find you know either it's still there in the old releases, but in the new releases we don't want to maintain it anymore. And so if you need to upgrade to the new release, you need to find a way to migrate off of it. And right. most of these things really have outlived their usefulness. I mean, you take a look at Security Manager, right? Um, applets, applets themselves. I don't. I don't um, it's taken a long time to get rid of applets, but you know, I think I think they're they're in the same category. RMI is 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 soon there. Finalization is on there. Oh, um, okay. Well, let's talk about that in a second. I just want to register that there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about Java Web Start and miss it. Okay, just I'm just going to put it out really? there. I really like that. It was the best of the web. It was like a full desktop app that I can just get from a browser. And ah, it's, yeah. You know, like I had, I could escape the sandbox of the applets and do real things like saving files, but also right. I could deliver an update to the software by re refreshing the browser page. You know, like it was just, it was so good, it was so good. And now I was just saying, we, we, it's it's hard to ramp down and then deprecate a thing, but at least you're not printing CDs anymore, right? Like, like yeah. imagine how hard that would have been. That there was, yeah. this is the version of Java that we shipped. It's got a bug. Oh well, you know. Um, you can just do update. Anyway, yeah. So, okay, finalization. What is that? What's that last? I think that's a good, uh, since we're about near our time. Yeah, we better, we better start to wrap this up, but we should talk about <laughs> finalization a little bit. So, so finalization is, was, is fun. Um, because, uh, I think this might be the, the oldest thing in the platform that we are intending to remove. Um, so finalization was present in JDK 1.0. Uh, so, so it goes all the way back to the beginning. Uh, Security Manager is not quite as old. I think the Security Manager was added in 1.1 or 1.2. Right. Uh, but, uh, and then, and then stuff, uh, you know, other stuff we've, we've deprecated was added, was added after that. But, uh, yeah, so finalization, um, is a pretty, I mean, all of these are particularly hairy, each in their own way. Yeah. Um, so I think finalization was, ah, <laughs> um, actually, it was kind of funny. Where I ran into you last was this re with JCP reception at the Computer History yeah. Museum. That was um, a lot of I also ran into Tim Lindholm there, who was the original, he used to work at Sun, and did he, I think he left before before the Oracle thing, but he used to work at Sun. He did the, he did, he did a lot. I worked with him a lot on Java ME and he okay. also wrote the, the, um, the first uh, JVM specification. And I asked him about this and it turns out that he was the guy who implemented finalization prior to 1.0. Yeah. Uh, prior at, at, our, at the insistence of Arthur Van Hoff, uh, who, who, ins who insisted that the garbage collector Clean up stuff after him. Uh, Tim Lindholm um, implemented this feature called finalization, and huh. so the idea is, I mean, it's it's an interesting idea in practice. It has a whole bunch of problems, um, but no. but the idea is, um, I mean, the typical thing is a file descriptor, right? So if you open if you open a file, that opens a file descriptor. That's an OS resource that's contained inside of a Java object. So um, should, should the Java programmer be asked to close that file explicitly by adding a close method, 
or what happens uh, what happens if the programmer forgets to do that or or what happens if you drop all references to this object and um, <clears throat> and the object is garbage collected well the object no longer exists but as far as the os is concerned your process still has that file stripper open uh, and 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 it's completely inaccessible now so you do need a way to clean that up yeah and so the idea of finalization is when the garbage collector determines that an object is unreachable then essentially i mean i mean the, the the principle makes a lot of sense when an object becomes unreachable i want some cleanup action to occur okay that's good the problem yeah. is the cleanup action is a method on that very object that was unreachable <laughs> but now you you have you have a thread that's running that you know that has access to this object again so it's kind of weird the the, mm -hmm. the 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 object became unreachable and then you call a method on it and now it's reachable again okay um and that's that's more than just weird that actually has a bunch of 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 problems associated with it so so um <clears throat> but uh what's the i mean there there i mean uh, there there are some issues with the way it was implemented you you finalizes a protected method on object and you in order for this to work you have to you have to call your super classes finalizer and if you fail to do so or if an exception gets thrown then finalize it then it breaks finalization uh, of those objects um, stuff like that can happen i think the, the worst problem is that this this opens up a whole line uh, well okay i think the worst problem is security there's also a performance problem um so the, the security problem is <clears throat> um the basic uh you know basic object-oriented programming in java is you your constructor gets called with your objects or with arguments and your constructor is responsible for validating those arguments and if any of those arguments is invalid what do you do well you throw an exception right and that, that means that whatever code called your constructor doesn't get a reference to that object. So for practical purposes, that object no longer exists. In fact, that object actually exists on the heap in its uninitialized or partially initialized state. Including to our apparel files and things like that that might have gotten initialized before the exception? Um, well, I mean, I think ideally you would not actually open a file until you value validated the constructor arguments. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, I'm trying to, I, I, I don't have a good example at the top of my head, but I mean, consider, well, I don't know. Um, I, I'll just have to hand wave around this, but basically. Sure. So, suppose you have suppose you have an object that um, its constructor validates its arguments and says, "Oh, these arguments are invalid. I want this object not to exist." But the only thing you can do is throw an exception. And for practical purposes, it doesn't exist because that object is unreachable. And so, if nothing can reach that object, then nothing can use it. And so, who's going to find it? For practical purposes, it's as good as dead. Now, the problem is with finalization is somebody can subclass your class and add a finalizer to it. And so that object actually, so, so then you can call a constructor, your constructor will throw an exception and leave that object unreachable on the heap. But in fact, it gets resurrected by the finalizer. And then now the finalizer can get its hand on this partially initialized object and use that to make mischief somewhere. Oh, wow. Yes. Oh, gross! I didn't. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is this is one of the reasons why you can't just say, "Oh, don't use finalization anymore," because essentially finalization can be used to attack innocent bystanders. And so, if you look carefully at certain certain uh, classes, so there 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 are some classes in the JDK which suffer from this because one is that they are publicly subclassable, uh, and two, they're actually very security sensitive. 
And so INAT address is one of them, I believe. And so if you look at the INAT address code, it goes to great lengths to defend himself to defend itself against uh, finalizer attacks. So hmm. um, yeah, basically, it's a sh you know it checks all its arguments and then creates an internal pro object. And so it, it it itself is a proxy to its internal state object. And the internal state object isn't actually created until all the ar objects have been validated. Um, and so therefore, a finalizer can't um, can't resurrect the internal state object. And it's like uh, yeah. it's terrible. It so, is so anyway, the other thing about finalization is that um, it makes the GC do more work. Yeah. Because the GC has already gone to the length of showing that this this object is unreachable. Um, but instead of just garbage collecting it, it has to call the finalizer on it. And so once the finalize, you know, the finalizer can do anything. It's just the Java method. You could allocate more memory, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Or it can plug it back into the object graph, right? So the upshot is that the G GC essentially has to start over. It can't collect this object. It has to prove once again that this object is unreachable before it actually actually will GC it. Yeesh. Um, and I mean, there, there are, you know, in addition to the performance issues, there are some some problems with um, um, it just adds more complexity and maintenance overhead and whatnot to all the GC implementations. Yeah. So is, I guess the question then is, okay, first of all, what happens to existing code with finalizers? Do you throw an exception or do you log it out when they upgrade to this new future facing version? And then part two is, is it, what's the alternative? Like auto closable and try with resources or what do we tell people yeah. to do instead? Okay, so this this is this is all discussed in JEP 421. Um, maybe we're gonna have to run through this and, and come up with all the links that we come up with here. But <laughs> um, so so yeah, so uh, so so what will happen in the future when we turn off finalization? Well, we're not entirely sure. Uh, there are a couple paths forward. One is that you know the system could refuse to load a a, a class that has a finalizer on it. Um, ah, yeah, that's it. Um, that um, that's kind of draconian because there are a lot of things that have finalizers on them. Um, and we can't do that until we get rid of, of usage of finalizers in the JDK. And there's still, there's still a bunch more that we need to, we need to work on. Um, yeah. This isn't, this isn't going to happen tomorrow. Sure. Um, but uh, you know, but another, so, so, but you know, we could issue warnings, we could refuse to load the class, that kind of stuff. Um, but another thing is, you know, another possibility is just say, um, sure, your class has a finalizer on it. The system is simply no longer going to call it. Um, and so that's, you know, won't that break something? Maybe, right? So, so there's this issue, which it, it, it depends on what you're using the finalizer for. So, so the yeah. first thing is in JDK 21, you can actually go, there's a command line option that you can, that will allow you to disable finalization today. So you can actually test your system to see if it's actually relying on finalization oh. to do it for you. Shake out the bugs. Nice. Yes. So you can disable finalization and we can also, there's also a JFR event that you can enable that will tell you uh, how many finalizers were actually invoked. Okay. Look at so, that. So there are some, yeah. And th those should be documented in 421. Interesting. So I'm looking for. So. Interesting. Yeah. So um, the problem is that suppose suppose you have suppose you have an object that represents a file that contains a file descriptor. Right. And and I think you you also mentioned try with resources. So yeah. as much as possible, you should you you should be using try with resources. Now it's not always possible, but you know there are there's old code out there that still, um, I mean there's still probably places lurking around in the JDK or probably in the tests where we probably say you know open something blah 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 you know straight code and then right. not close. It's like well that really should be try with resources because if right. it occurs in here you're going to leak that resource. Right, and so so maybe code like that is implicitly relying on finalizers to 
to clean up after them. But the problem is, if your class has a finalizer, even if you properly close every instance, the finalizer is still going to run. Right. And the finalizer is going to run and it's going to say, oh, it's already closed. Do nothing. So the fact that a finalizer was actually called is not itself indicative of a real issue. Right. So you kind of have to go look at the code to the finalizer to see if it's, um, to see what it's doing. Um, and, and so maybe what you would want to do is put in some diagnostics there to say, you know, if a finalizer ran and didn't do any, you know, didn't do anything because the thing was already closed, then you're okay. But if finalizer ran and detected something that, oh, huh, this is actually a leak, then maybe you should log a message. Right. Hmm. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, because if you've got like a file descriptor left in the wake of an object that has since been garbage collected, then yeah, that, I'm sure you can detect that, right? Yeah. Um, well, so so the, the code can detect it, but the problem is the, the JVM and the JDK cannot. Oh, why not? Well, because because that's that's part of the object state, and we don't know what's going on in the object state. I mean, you know, suppose, uh, you know, s suppose, uh, oh, I don't know. Suppose you're checking database connections out of a connection pool. Yeah. And you check it back in, right? How, you know, maybe a finalizer can say, oh, is this, uh, you know, yeah. Suppose you forgot to check it back in. And then you dropped all references to it. Maybe the finalizer logic itself could could come up and poke around and say, "Have I been checked back into the pool?" Right. <laughs> if not, that's a bug. But but oh, you know, right. you can tell that's 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 far above the. I mean, I wish there actually. If somebody has any brilliant ideas, I mean, we thought about this a fair amount. I don't know if there's any way the JVM or the JDK can actually detect this. Well, okay, you're right. Network sockets are strange but what about like files if i have an object and then when i create the i create the object now there's a file somewhere that's a file descriptor i garbage collect that object that file descriptor is still there should we log a warning or like, it's unreasonable you know well yeah i think it would be good to log a warning in that case but i think the the responsibility for doing so is in the mm -hmm. finalizer itself not in the finalization mechanism yeah Okay. Wow. This is okay. I can't. I'm gonna try running that disable uh, yeah. flag. That I really want to see. It's just dash dash finalization equals disabled. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you have a load test or anything like that, or or I, you know. So I think I suggest in there what you could do is like, you know, you know, do a, yeah, do a heap dump or something like that. You know, do a sorry, you know, run a load test or run some kind of run some kind of test suite and see what your heap looks like and then disable finalization and then run the same thing and, and see if see if there's an accumulation of, of of objects or you know look at the heap dumps or something wow oh man this is going to be a weird this is y2k this is <laughs> this is an interesting bug i didn't i, I didn't even i don't even know where i'd be affected because obviously in my code i don't use finalizers but yeah somewhere that i'm using and you just said the jdk itself won't start if I run this flag, no, um, no, no, that's a, that's that's a future possibility, uh, but but that's not in there yet. No, disabled mean dis finalization disabled merely means your finalized methods won't get called. Okay, including those in the JDK though. Right. So we could get some very interesting side effects there. That's, I wonder. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Could be fun. Yep. Um, on that. Final note. Uh, this has been just. Oh my goodness! I, 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 we've only scratched the surface. I think I've. Um, I, I, I have so much respect for everything you're doing, obviously, and I didn't realize you had been doing the your the good work you've been doing for nearly forty years now. So wow, um, amazing, amazing. Uh, really grateful for. I, I start. I started this conversation by saying at the outset how grateful I am that you took time to hang out with us and elucidate the, the the latest and the greatest but what 40 almost 40 years that's you're you're a legend man thank you very much yeah. um where do people uh, well first of all are you on the internet and if so 
Uh, where do people find you if you want to be found? Yeah, uh, I think the best place is on Mastodon. Okay, Mastodon. Yeah, so where I am, I am, oh, I got to figure out how to do this. Oh, here we are, yeah. Is there a way I can paste this into the? Yeah, just put it in the comments and I'll, uh, it's at Stuart Marks at Mastodon oh. social. Yeah, why don't you put it in there? I it's gonna ask me to log it's asking me to log in and do a bunch of crap before I can post no, no. it. <laughs> comment. Okay. Does that look right uh, to you? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um okay. And then anything people should be on the lookout? Are you I mean, you know, I, I leave this usually the if if there's anything you want to hawk. Uh, now is the time, you know, but whatever you want, like if, if there is actually a place they can go buy Dr. Deprecator uh, shirts, this is now the time. So. <laughs> yeah, sorry, no Dr. Deprecator merch. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I think the thing is um, there's a tremendous, we put a, we put a lot of effort into putting stuff into the Jeps. And so there's right. a tremendous amount of information there. And so like you looked at, you posted the link to Jep 421. So that's, that's about uh, finalization. Um, and so there is, there is some stuff buried in there and sometimes they get a little too long, but you know, if you power through it, there are little details embedded there, like the uh, disable finalization flag in this JFR event. Um, but actually that is really interesting because I think we're trying to confront this, which is, <clears throat> um, I think there is this open quest. I mean, I, I mean, th this isn't, I mean, this is sort of my parting thought here, but this is something that is actually come to the front of my mind recently, which is, you know, we've been discussing this. If we simply disable finalization by default, right. um, that could end up breaking programs in a very subtle way because they might start getting, you know, weird resource, you know, out of, out of memory errors or maybe, you know, weird resource leaks somehow that'll manifest themselves in very subtle ways. And we would like to notify people that their systems have a problem, yeah. But, but it's also it's also difficult to do that, as we discussed with you know you know if 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 an object has some resource, the 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 JVM doesn't actually know anything about the state of that resource. So um, so I guess the the call to action is you know try these things out, the disable finalization and the JFR event. And if there's, and, and see what they do. And if they, if they don't do what you need to do, then let us know if they, if they do work great, but also what's missing. Are there, I think that, I think our nightmare scenario is the next, re, you know, so not, not the next release, but some future release of the JDK goes out with finalization disabled by default. And it, you know, people upgrade and and it starts hurting them in production because, you know, because there's this change in the system that they weren't aware of. Right. And so what should we be, what more should we be doing to notify people that this change is coming? And what can we do? What changes in the runtime or tooling can we do to help people avoid this problem? Okay. Hear me out. Okay. Do so you 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 ship like Clippy, but it's Duke, and it, and, it, and it, it's like and it's, his name is Dukey, and he's like it looks like you're trying to deploy to production, and then it says, hey, have you made sure to deprecate your finalizers? Yeah, you don't seem convinced. Okay, I'll I'll keep I'll I'll keep noodling on it. All right, keep, yeah. Um, thank you, thank you so much, and uh, right. yeah, I I have I, I'm forever uh, grateful that. Java is in your very capable hands. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks very much. It's been uh, it's been really fun being on here, and thanks for letting me talk about all this all this stuff that's been going on for so so long, and and is continuing to go on. Yes, it's still going on. Ne there's never been a better time to be a Java developer. Ever. Yeah. it's just the best. Thanks everybody. Thanks for hanging out. The, right. the new hangers on. Okay. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. Bye.